Ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to welcome you to the second outing of Simon Gambold. Uh, we did one probably, was it four weeks ago, Simon? I can't remember now. Um, great response. Uh, and we had a lot of people saying, I'd like to do it again, but could we try a different time? So uh, we're now an hour later. Um, thank you all for joining and, and giving us your, your evening or a part of it. Um, the format is basically, I will shut up in a moment because Simon is the headline act. He will then talk for around about 50 minutes and then we'll have a, uh, those of you who are new to Zoom or have been on Zoom, you will probably have a little Q&A box. So if you want to ask any questions, please do. The, the idea is that, that you can ask them throughout the presentation, but we will deal with them at the end, um, just so as we don't disrupt um, Simon's flow. We're going to set the final time at 830 now, obviously, if there are loads of questions and we haven't got to that point where they're all answered, then we will end up sorting those out later. We can do that for you again. We, we can do that via email. Um, so basically, without much further ado, um, welcome. Welcome, Simon. Some of you may remember Simon. I've known Simon for we tried to work it out last time and it's got to be over 20 years i would have thought um simon is um now um, basically promoting and helping people engage with their team um i knew simon and first met him when he was something high powered within henry shine um and then he went on to become even more high powered within henry shine and i think eventually when you something to do with something to do with europe or something in charge of europe or something yeah. so i can't quite remember um, but Simon went on to lofty, lofty positions with Henry Schein and then uh, retired uh, probably a couple of years ago, was it Simon? I can't quite remember to be honest. Two um, years, next month. Oh really, there we go. Um, which was, was Shine's loss and uh, the rest of the dental market's benefit. So really, without further ado Simon, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Chris. Well, uh, it's a fantastic uh, pleasure to be able to speak to you guys. Um, thank you. I want to thank Chris and the rest of the team at Frank Taylor for setting this up. Um, it's great to be able to talk about something I'm passionate about. I love developing and building teams and I want to share my passion with you. Um, it's really exciting leadership, um, awakening people's potential, creating outstanding and customer experiences and a great place to work. And that's what I love doing. Um, and you can go further as a team. If you want to go fast, go alone. But if you want to go far, go together. And it's terrifically rewarding. Um, since lockdown, as we've all come back into practice and we've been working with fewer patients, spending longer with, it, with each patient's profitability and productivity is a real challenge. So one of the things we can do with team engagement is to improve the productivity in the practice, as well as improving the customer experience and of course, creating a happier workplace. So it's a win-win-win really, getting involved in leadership, but it's a challenge. And many people say to me when I do programs, well, of course you, you're either born a leader or you're not, isn't that right? And I say, well, no. Um, you can learn to be a leader. It's like any other skill. Um, if you practice and practice and practice, you can become a more and more effective leader. And I, I think I'm a good example of that. So we'll talk a bit about that. Um, being a good leader is about listening to people and engaging in relationships, about being authentic. And we'll talk about the, the, the attributes shortly. Um, but it's really important that we practice and we practice and we keep experimenting and growing. And I have a development plan for myself around my leadership. And I would, I would encourage all of you where I know you have a very thorough personal development plan for your, the clinical side of your, uh, your work, but to create a development plan for the non-clinical side and for your leadership is really important. And we'll, we'll touch a bit on that later. So there are some simple steps that if you repeat them consistently, they will work. So for example, when you go on a course and learn how to place a new composite, you'll prepare the cavity, you'll, you'll um, put in the, um, oh, I've forgotten the term now, 
it's gone. You etch it, that's it. You etch it and you bond it and you place, you place the composite and you layer the composite. And every time you do it, you etch, you bond and you place the composite. And you do that again and again and again. What you don't do is after a week go, oh, actually today I'm not going to do the etching, I'll just do the bond and the composite. And then the following week you don't go, I won't bother with the etch and bond, I'll just put the composite in. And the reason you don't do that is because the restoration is going to fail. It's much more likely to fail and you won't be successful. So what clinicians are really good at is consistently take, doing every step again and again and again and getting a good result. So leadership practice is like that. We need to set out and practice our skills and repeat them consistently and not be tempted on Monday morning when we're really busy and there's a rush and there's lots going on in the practice, not be tempted to go, oh, actually, I'll skip that meeting, that one-to-one -one meeting I had with my receptionist. I'll skip it just this week because that's the equivalent of that and our leadership will weaken and will fail if we do that. So it's consistent behaviour. Uh, simple steps applied consistently. So why am I here speaking to you? What experience do I have? Well, I mean, I've got 40 years experience in business, the last 30 years of which have been leading and build, building the leading teams. I moved from marketing into, into creating teams. And for 25 years or so, I've been in the dental industry. I love working with dental teams. I love oral hygiene. I've worked with charities. I've worked with, with government institutions. I've lobbied on behalf of the industry at the UK and European level. So when I left Henry Shine a couple of years ago, after five years of flying around Europe and, and the world, I had enough of that. Um, I thought, what can I do? I love leadership and I love working with dental teams. So I put the two together and that's how I set up my coaching business, engage the team. So I have got experience. I'm a, a qualified coach. Um, I've been through the Harvard Ambitious Leadership Programme. And as I say, I've got experience of achieving results. So that's why I feel I'm qualified uh, to talk to you. So what are we going to cover? Well, learn how to build effective communication with your team. I'll just rattle through these. Gaining an increased awareness of the importance of leadership skills in team effectiveness. Maintenance of skills, behaviours and attitudes that will strengthen the confidence of the whole team. Um, I put in some lessons from practice now. I've been working with teams, particularly this year during COVID. Um, and we got an opportunity at the end to ask questions. So that, that's what I want to cover. Uh, but as I said, I'm going to rattle through this fairly quickly, but we can we can run another session, as Chris says, if, if you guys want that. And I'm available on a one-to-one -one basis to support practices as well. So let's talk a little bit about leadership um, in general terms. You know, each of these leaders um, had an has, an, has or had a, an evangelical following. Um, obviously, a couple of them still do. Um, and they were very authentic. The way they led was influenced by their personality and their behavior. And they're very different, but they each had that following. And people trusted them and they believed whatever they said and they would follow them to the ends of the earth. And this is always held up as being what leadership should be. And these people are very special and very charismatic and people think, oh, well, I could never do that. But each of us in our own way can be a leader. Whether we're running a practice or, or not, it doesn't matter. The people we work with, we can demonstrate leadership to. And if we treat them in the right way, they will look to us for leadership. And what we do in large organisations is we look for the people who are creating for a following, have got leadership behaviour, and we then promote them into leadership roles. We don't promote them and then expect them to catch up. We see the behaviour, then we promote them and we encourage them. So it's really, really important to build that trust and that trust comes over time and the personality of your leadership should be grounded in your, your personality, so you're authentic. Um, it's really important to pay attention at the moment, you know, more than ever to unconscious prejudice. It's very topical at the moment, but it's important that we pay attention to diversity in our teams our teams reflect that the customer base, the demographic of the customer base we serve. Um, we want to make sure that we respect equality, we respect the environment. These are all things that are important in our team. And our team will look to us as leaders to be aware of these things and to make sure that we take them into account. So let's just start with a, with a definition of, um, one of the definitions I like particularly is, you know, leadership is the art and science of influencing people. 
And that's what it's about. We're building relationships so we can influence people, to get them to do what we want, um, and putting it at its most cynical level. But really, it's all about influencing. And my favorite, um, favorite definition really is about helping team members be more successful than they think they can be. Now, when I was a successful leader, I was helping my team members be successful. And that's what most good leaders aspire to. And what I've learned as I've developed my leadership is actually you can help people be more successful than even they think they can be. So we're untapping potential, the potential that people have, but for whatever reason they may think, oh, I'm not good enough for that. I'm not gonna go for that promotion. I couldn't do that. And as leaders, we can give them permission. We can help them realize that potential. And this is one of the places that improved productivity comes from in the workplace as people release that potential. So it's very, very powerful. We want to make sure that, um, you know, when we go around and talk to people, we are consistent in what we say and we listen to them and we're open and honest. So um, engaging our team members and getting them motivated to be part of the team is what it's all about. And as people get engaged and motivated, they're going to put more in and they're going to get more out. So they'll have more ideas, more enthusiasm, and they'll collaborate more and they'll work harder and they'll, they'll do that extra bit of work before they go home in the evening. They'll put that extra bit of effort in. And as a team, that increases the performance of the team enormously. Um, and of course, it increases the experience that the customers have. So, you know, when you come in and I remember going into practices and the reception I get when I go up to the front desk, you know, is really, really powerful. No one knows who I am and the smile I get. I remember one practice, the trouble that the receptionist took to make a cup of coffee to the prescription that I wanted exactly as I wanted. And she brought it over with the most amazing smile. And I felt really fantastic when I went in to see the dentist. And she, she made me feel really good. And she did that because she was motivated and engaged and wanted to provide a good service. And uh, that, is, that is the single most important thing that she could have done. Um, really, really important. And that's what you get when you've got your team engaged. Very, very powerful. And team does come first. And I, I went through university, did marketing, and I learned that the customer is the most important stakeholder in a business. Because you've got five stakeholders. You've got your customers, your suppliers, you've got your investors and you've got your community that you serve and you've got your team and marketing and business people will tell you the customer is king the customer comes first what i've learned over 40 years is yeah the customer is important but they're not the most important constituent the most important constituent is the team if the team aren't engaged it doesn't matter how good you are with your customers it doesn't matter how good your rapport is with your patient in the chair if they leave the surgery and go out into the front office and the team are demotivated, that that's going to spoil it. If you put your your fees up and the, and the girl at the front desk says, oh, well, it's, oh, the fees have gone up again. It's really expensive, isn't it? It's going to undo all your good work. So number one is getting your team on board. And it's all about your team. And that's what we're going to talk about. So this is this is my favorite model for any organization. And I've, I've run teams from three to 3,000 people. And this applies whether it's a dental practice or a dental hospital or a department of health or any organization you're in. I liken it to a bicycle. And on that bike is the team. And there are three groups of people on this bike. There's the, there's the group at the front, there's that, row, that front row, and maybe some people in the second row who are really motivated. They love their job. They're real advocates for your business. They love you. They're pedaling really hard. They're helping to steer and they're really enthusiastic. And the second group is the back row and maybe a couple of people near the back row and they are not enthusiastic and then they're pissed off and they don't want to do it and they're not pedaling and they may even be braking they may even have their hands on the brakes and they'll be infecting the people in front of them with their cynicism and their negativity and then you've got the group in the middle which is 75 80 percent of your team maybe 90 percent of the team and they're quite happy they're pedaling along they're working to live they want to earn an income, they're going to go home at night and be with their families. And they're pedaling away quite happily and they could pedal harder. And the challenge is, how do we deal with each of these three groups to make the bike work better and go faster? So first and foremost, the group at the front are great. They're advocates. 
they're fine, leave them alone, <laughs> don't interfere with them. Our, our nature is to go to them, encourage them. They don't need encouragement, leave them alone. The group at the back we need to focus on because they have a disproportionate effect on the rest of the team and we need to get them sorted. Now, maybe they're in the wrong seat on the bus. You may have heard that expression. Um, and I have got people in the past who've been in the wrong job and I've moved them to the right job and they've become, the light's gone on and they've been brilliant. Um, quite often though, these people are, for whatever reason, they are not motivated and they won't be motivated. And the minute you take your focus off them, they'll return to form um, and you need to get them off the bus, get them out of the business. Um, and this can be uncomfortable, but usually if you hold people to account and ask them to perform and just keep checking, they'll go, oh, I don't like this, and they'll leave of their own account. And or they'll step up and perform. And you're really then you can focus on the group in the middle. And that's where as leaders our focus should be. That group, if we can get them to pedal a little bit faster, then our business is going to be dramatically more successful. And we don't need to make them all advocates. This is the thing that a lot of people think, well, I've got to make them all advocates. You don't. That group in the middle only has to pedal one or two or three percent faster. And you imagine how much faster that bike's going because there's so many of them. And if you imagine along this street, there are three or four bikes because there are three or four dental practices in your town or in your street. And you just need to cycle faster than the other ones. Um, and they won't be motivated and they won't be engaged. So your team can cycle faster and they can move forward. So the productivity, the performance of the whole business will increase. So those are the three groups in the business. And those are the three teams that we need to think about as leaders as we move the business forward. And a quick point, when you recruit people, obviously you want competent people who can do what they say they can do, but you're really recruiting for attitude. You want people who are gonna be motivated and want to work. And we'll, we'll talk about how we can in, encourage that as well. But first and foremost, you wanna recruit for attitude um, and get people on board who are gonna have the right approach. And there's lots of evidence for this engagement. You know, if you engage team members, the organization performs better. There are a lot of studies being done. I won't go through all of these, but you know, productivity goes up, customer service goes up. Um, and the key factors here, you know, a Harvard Business Review, ADP Research Institute study that was done in, in 2018 of a thousand organizations in 19 countries, you know, showed that the two ingredients, the key ingredients of engagement are working as a team and trusting the leader. So the two most important things for team members when they want to feel engaged is they want to feel they're working as part of a team. So you can see the importance of bringing the team together, making people feel that they're not on their own. And secondly, trust in their leader. We'll talk more about this, but do they trust you? Do they feel they can be honest and open with you and come to you and, and rely on you to support them? So those are the two most critical factors. But all the reports show improved productivity, you know, reduced absenteeism, higher profitability and improved customer service. So it, it's a win-win for the organization. So leadership, there are a number of attributes and there's a, there's a one week program on the different kind of leadership styles, which I'm not going to jump into now, but I just want to touch on half a dozen key attributes that are important as a leader that we should think about. And I want to touch on each of these briefly. So passion, clearly, you know, we have to be passionate about what we're doing. And that's what I love about dental teams I've worked with over the years. You are passionate about what you're doing, about helping your patients, improving their rural health, improving their smiles. Um, so you're already there and that passion, you can communicate that. I mean, dentists in my experience communicate it brilliantly to patients. Sometimes they don't communicate to their teams as passionately and that's something we need to remember. We need to be passionate about what we're doing with our teams as well as with our customers, with our patients. So the passion needs to come over and we need to be authentic. So we want to create um, a strong leadership profile for ourselves in a way that's authentic to ourselves. So trying to be something you're not. Uh, People are going to see through that. But it, it's challenging because we need to learn new habits. So I'll give you an example. I, uh, When I started leading teams and working with people, I started to treat, teach myself to smile when I spoke to people and said hello and I smiled to them. And they said to me, how are you, how are you Simon? And I started saying, excellent or really good. And I was 
it wasn't authentic initially because I was putting it on, but I said it every time. And guess what happened? After a while, I started to feel excellent and I started to feel really good. Now, if I, I didn't feel well, I wouldn't say I felt excellent, clearly. But if I was feeling okay, I would say excellent. And as that became authentic, that became me and it made me feel more positive. So that was a habit that I took on that influenced the kind of leader I was. And gradually I added to that. I started saying, I'm excellent. How can I help you? So I was turning my attention to them and indicating to them, I'm here to listen to you and help you. And I was doing that authentically. But it's again, it's practicing behaviors again and again and again. And we're as good as the last interaction we have with our team. Now, if we screw something up, it means we've screwed it up. But the good news is, if you get it right the next time, that's what people will remember. And of course, as you know, particularly at those of us who've had children, people learn from what we do, not what we say. So, you know, saying one thing and doing another isn't going to cut it. It's what we do that matters. So we've got to make sure we walk the talk and we'll come back to that. Thirdly, vision. It's really important that we have a vision that excites the team and gets them behind us. Why should they work extra hard? Why should they input extra, extra effort? Um, where is it we as a team are going? And we'll, we'll come back and talk about vision, but it's really important. Fourthly, expertise. Clearly, we need to know what we're doing. We need to be experts in our field. And, you know, the clinicians I work with have studied for years. They practice for years. Uh, they're brilliant at what they do. And that expertise is there. But it's really important that, that we have that. Trust is really, really important. And it's not just about trust in the team, but trust in ourselves. So we want the, tr the team to trust us. So we've got to sh delegate to them, trust them to do things. They'll do them differently. They'll get them wrong sometimes. That's okay. Our job is to help them and encourage them to try again and learn from their mistakes. But also trust in ourselves. And I remember when I was, um, before I joined Henry Shine, I was at WH Smith Business Supplies and they were integrating loads of companies together, smashing them all together. I was a marketing manager and clearly there were going to be six companies were going to become one and there's going to be one head of marketing and I was getting as it went on I was getting less and less comfortable and confident and I thought no I, I won't be the manager um, I'm going to leave and there were a bunch of reasons but that was one of them so I left Smith and I actually ended up with Shine which was great um, but I didn't trust myself at the time I said to myself oh I don't trust the company to make me the to make me the head of marketing because when I resigned the MD came to me and said oh we were going to make you the head of marketing don't go I'm like, well, it's too late now. But I realized on reflection later that I didn't trust myself. I didn't have confidence in myself. So at Henry Shine, I relaxed and I trusted myself and the organization. And I kept getting promoted almost before I was ready. And I had to say, slow down, slow down. But I was completely relaxed about it and started to trust in myself. Um, and finally, cultural fit. You know, when we recruit, I talked about recruiting for attitude, but we can also recruit for values. So we need to make sure what are the values that we believe in as an individual? And I would guess most of us have those in our minds, whether we've written them down or not, it's another matter, useful exercise to do. Um, and something I take the teams through that I work with is get them to put down their, agree a set of values that they want to live by. The values, how they want to treat each other and they want to treat their patients. And the same common things come up about being ethical and professional and having a happy workplace. There are common threads, but it's important for people to volunteer that, sign up to it and agree to it and hold themselves to account to that. And again, as we recruit by asking people about their experience and how they've handled situations in the past and, and their work, you can find out what their, what their values are and make sure that you recruit people to fit. I've been really, really lucky. I mean, I've chosen carefully, but I've also been lucky. I've worked for organizations who my, my values have fitted very closely to their values. You know, I chose Henry Schein, for example, very carefully. And in 25 years, there was only once they asked me to do something that I didn't want to, didn't agree with. And uh, I said, no. And they were like, okay, that's fine. We'll get someone else to do it. And I never detected that I, my career was damaged because of that. Um, they respected it and they got someone else to do it. Um, but it only happened once and I'm really proud of that, that, that the values fit was very good. So that's important for you and the team. 
let's just spend a moment on that first one, which 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 is vision. Um, I, I call this a higher purpose because um, if you want teams to follow you and you want teams to input that extra bit of effort, they they really need to feel that there's, there's something powerful driving them. So. What are you as a team trying to achieve in the next three to five years? What, what's your ambition? What's your goal as a principal or as a dentist? Um, and what do you want the people who come with you, who support you to achieve themselves and get out of it themselves? And organisationally, we call this having a higher purpose. The great news is that, you know, as a clinician, as a, as a healthcare professional, you, got, you guys have already got, you're helping people um, improving their smiles, improving their oral health, getting them out of pain, identifying potential cancers. I mean, this is a, a fantastic um, purpose to have. Um, but of course, you're competing with other practices who've got the same purpose. So there is a need to lift actually above that. Um, your nurses could leave and go to another practice that, all, that also provides oral care and you know helps people with their smiles. So what is it about you and your team that's doing something extra special? Um, what is it about your team and the community that's special? Why should people join your team? Why should they go that extra mile? So this is something that I put together when I'm working with teams. We get the team to develop a vision, um, a higher purpose that they can aspire to and they can really, really motivates them to work and then gets their commitment and pulls them together as a team. And you can set future goals around that. It's really exciting, particularly if you work together as a team and build it together and it, and it provides real meaning. Now we, we all need meaning in our lives and very often our work provides that. Um, and as, as clinicians you've studied for many years, you have this innately, um, but a lot of team members you recruit may not have that. They may just be doing a job to earn money nine to five and you want to transition them from that to someone who's passionate about oral care and about dentistry. Um, and that's what having a vision is about. So really, really important. And now as leaders, how we show up is, is also a key element for us because we are always on show all the time. And I remember at, um, I was at a sales, me a sales meeting when I was, uh, I think I was a marketing director, I was an MD at Shine. I was at a sales meeting and we'd had a great day and there was, was three or 400 team members there. and. We, a group of us gone to the bar afterwards and we relax and it's all first name terms and we're chatting away and uh, my boss who's president of Europe said to me you know um, Simon you mustn't forget that at all times you have a little badge on your forehead saying managing director all right whatever you say whether it's three in the morning in a hotel room after a bottle of whiskey it's the managing director saying that at all times, you can't get away from that. And uh, you must never forget that. And that I've never forgotten him saying that to me. Um, we are always leaders, whether we meet a team member in the, in the supermarket at the weekend, whether we meet them at a party, whether, wherever we bump into them or any time in the practice, we are always the leader. So how we show up is really, really important. And there will always be a time when you step back. There was always a time at the part, the after, conference parties where I left and left the team to get on with it. So there was a point where I'm there and there was a point where I would leave. And uh, you, only you can work out when that is with your team. So in terms of showing up, we want to make sure that we have the right mindset because we want to be positive and optimistic, but we want to be realistic. And I think clear eyed optimism uh, is how I would craft it. So we want to be clear-eyed and realistic, but optimistic. So we're, we're glass half full people, but we don't want to be unrealistic and set targets of people that are going to go, well, that's just ridiculous. We can never achieve that. So clear-eyed optimism, optimism leading forward. Okay, really, really important. The second key area is focus as leaders. It's our job to focus the team, you know, particularly at meetings and in discussions, Focus the team into what we can actually control because I'm sure you've heard this before, the three circles, there's, there's a big circle of around us of um, areas of concern, things that concern us. And my goodness, today, you know, there are so many things out there that economically, politically, and in healthcare terms that concern us and we can worry about, but we've got no control over them no control at all. And then within that, there's a smaller circle of things that we can influence. 
So we're not the arbiter of what happens, but we can influence some of those things. And then within that, there's a small circle of control of the things that we directly can affect. And to be productive and to be positive, we need to make sure that we bring ourselves and the team back to the, the circle of control. We can talk about the, the concerns and the influences, but at the end of the day, we're not going to be productive if we keep focusing on things that we can't affect. We're just going to get depressed. So we need to come back to what we can control and to some degree what we can influence and focus on those. So really important. And, and the third thing is practices, you know, walking the talk. Um, as I said earlier, you know, what we say is one thing, but it's what we do that people pay attention to and that's what they believe and um, you know I went up to when I was running the UK business for Shine I did I spoke to all 650 team members four times a year at the, at the 13 locations around the UK and um, I went every quarter and when I first turned up and did an update and spoke to the team and asked some questions and I said no, I'm going to come back every quarter and they're like yeah 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 so and I'm in the Glasgow office I went back the second time into Glasgow office and they're like oh Simon's come back Anyway, I did my update, answer questions, got, got a couple of questions, but not a lot. See you next time. Yeah. Third time I turned up, they're like, oh, he came back. Then they start, then third time I could see it was sinking in and they started to ask me questions and they started to get interest. So it didn't matter that I said I was going to do it. The third time I did it, they, they saw it and they believed it. Okay. So walking the talk, really, really important. And in terms of managing team members, we've got to blend um, being tough on performance, holding people to account. If we agree we're going to do something, we need to do it and we need to manage that performance, but being kind-hearted on the people, being empathetic about people's needs, being ready to understand if someone's falling short for a personal reason um, or getting close to them on that um, and balancing you know, tough on standards of performance, but kind-hearted on people. And that, that's a real challenge. And I have quite often when I'm mentoring a dentist, they'll talk to me about, you know, I don't want to get involved in people's personal life. Or I don't want to ask personal stories. How do I approach that conversation? And that, that is challenging. And it's about asking open-ended questions and shutting up and listening. And if people want to tell you something, they'll tell you. If they don't, they won't, and that's fine. But by asking open-ended questions, if there are things people want to tell you and need to tell you, they'll get round to it and they will tell you. And then just listen, wait for them to finish, and then probably just go away with it um, and come back later once you've reflected on it. Um, we don't have to have an answer for everything straight away. Quite often, of course, people just want to be heard. Um, and quite often, they just want permission for a course of action that they believe is right. So mindset focus and practices, three key areas. So let's have a look at some lessons. I put together some lessons that I use in practice, influenced by our experience since COVID. Um, and I'll go through these now and hopefully these will be, be useful to you. So first of all, preparing yourself. You know, it's really important that we are present, we're uh, at our best and we're performing well. And we won't do that unless we get enough sleep, that we're comfortable at home and we've got the right what's what's normally called the work-life balance which i don't like the term work life uh, for me my work is a big part of my life so i talk about work and home um, but this is a nice exercise to do and I, I would encourage you to do this so draw a circle either now or later when you can think about it but i draw a circle we're going to create a pie chart with three sections in it the first one is sleep the second one is work and the third one is home so how much time do you actually spend on an average day sleeping? You know, is it eight hours? Is it six hours? Is it seven hours? Is it nine hours? Um, so carve out, if it's eight hours, it's a third. So you carve a third of the triangle uh, of, the, of the circle out uh, for sleep. And the second piece is work. How many hours do you spend at work? This is not commuting. Commuting, uh, it doesn't count as work time. So commuting is time in the practice. Uh, how much time do you spend doing that? And is that eight hours? Carve that out. And then the other the other segment is home. Um, now there are complexities around home offices and working at home. If you're doing emails at home, that doesn't count. I'm sorry. And I would encourage you not to do emails at home. Put your phone away and look at it occasionally, perhaps once in the evening. But don't keep looking at your phone. If you try and do work 
If you try and do emails at home, what will happen is you're going to screw up, you won't do the work properly and you'll screw up your home time and your family won't appreciate that. So separate the two. I mean, if you have a home office and you shut yourself away for three hours on a Saturday, then fine, that's work. But don't try and mix the two up, it doesn't work. Now, once you've got those three segments, I would also divide the work segment up into clinical and non-clinical. And particularly as a practice owner or a principal, um, the balance of those two is really important. And you may have heard this before, I don't know, but um, the, more t- the less time you spend clinically, the more successful your business would be. I say that again, the less time you spend clinically, the more successful your business will be, assuming you're doing the right things in that non-clinical time, which we'll come back to. So you've done this pie now of sleep, work and home. And when you reflect on this later, after this lecture, what would the ideal scenario be? You know, if you're getting six hours sleep, is that enough? So when I was flying around Europe for those five years, I was getting five or six hours sleep a night because we had dinners in the evening. It was up early, strange bed. I'd be drinking sometimes. You know, we had breakfast meetings. I was getting about six hours sleep. I need about eight and I was constantly tired and I wasn't away around it. And I just wasn't performing as well. I was performing okay, but I mean, I'm just, I knew I wasn't performing as well as I could perform. And part of me starting this coaching business is that I get eight hours sleep every night and I feel a lot better and fresher. Whether I've been drinking or not, I feel a lot fresher and better, and I'm delivering more value as a result. And you can structure your day around what's best for you. And yes, there'll be exceptions, of course there will, but I'm talking about what's the average that you're going to achieve. You know, and you can set that up to work. And I found when I'm working with, with principals, you know, we can move the start time and the end time. We can take away the mobile phone messages in the evenings. We can shift the clinical, non-clinical time so that we can actually get a more profitable, productive practice without increasing the hours in the practice necessarily. You know, we can change the clinical hours to be more productive, to be higher billing hours. You know, so there's ways of moving it around. But the important thing is to start out with what you really need in terms of sleep time and home time and office time. So that's a good exercise to do. Being present. Um, you know, uh, the, act, the act of being present with somebody um, is so important. Making eye contact and listening. Um, paying attention and listening. And I use this expression, waiting for the silence to end. What do I mean by that? Well, we talked about asking open-ended questions and shutting up and listening. And then when your colleague finishes talking, we're always thinking about, my answer is going to be this, I want to say that, yes, but I want to say that. And we jump in and we need to let them finish and pause. Are they going to say anything else? No. And then we can speak. And in fact, I remember when I recruited some years ago, a a CFO who I I actually recruited him in the end. And when I asked him a question at the interview, he waited quite a long time to answer. So much so that I was like, what's the matter with him? Why isn't he answering? And of course, I realized he was thinking about his answer. (laughs) He was thinking about what I'd said, assimilating it and thinking of the right answer. And his answers are really good. And he wasn't rushing and he was taking his time. So he was waiting for the silence to end, thinking of his answer and then moving on. So very, very powerful. Um, I said to you, I added, how can I help? And I found that when I was in my office, I had an open door policy and there were hundreds of people on site. So there would be people walking in all the time and I wanted them to feel they could come and talk to me. It's first name terms, the MD is Simon, and people walk past my office, they can come in. Oh, hello, Simon. And the gold dust, they'll tell you the things they tell you and ask you, it's brilliant. But I'd be in the middle of something and I'd have three reports to write and I'd have a call in five minutes and I had to get this done before the call. So when someone comes in, hello, Simon, and you look up and I found I could see in their faces, they'd see my face and they'd see frustration, annoyance, and what? You know, even though I didn't say anything, I thought, I can't let them see that. So I decided that when somebody came into my office, I would stop, pause, compose my face, look up. How can I help you? And I stopped getting that reaction in their faces. And I was forcing myself, it sounds wrong force, but you've got to do this because you've got all the pressure of the next patient, the next treatment plan, what's going to happen, the deadline. 
You've got to force yourself to pay attention to that person and listen to what they're saying. Nothing else is more important. And when people said to me, where did you find the time to go around and see 650 people four times a year? I said, that's my job. That is the most important thing I've got to do. I'll fit in all the reporting and everything else around it, okay? That's the most important job. So being there for your team is the most important thing you've got to do. Now, how you balance that with your patients, you need to work that out. But you cannot sacrifice your team members because of your patients. You've got to find the right balance for that. And they have a problem. They're coming to you usually with a problem. And the thing is, you don't need to answer that. You don't need to come up with a solution. In most cases, they know what the answer is. If you give them time, they will tell you what the answer is. And you can prompt them with, what do you think we could do about that? They'll then tell you what the answer is. What they're actually looking for is permission, maybe some resources, but usually it's just permission. Are you okay with that? Can I go ahead and do that? So you haven't created another job for yourself. You've actually, they brought you a problem and a solution, and they just want permission to go and do that. So that, that's really important, but you won't get there unless you listen and maybe tease out a little bit, but if you listen, you'll get that information. It's fantastic. Um, and the team comes first, you know, you've got to try and ensure in your mind, and I know we always put our customers and our patients first, but you have to find a way of compartmentalizing that so that the team come first without disadvantaging the patients. And I've seen it done brilliantly and uh, it's possible to do. So thirdly, um, develop your story. So we talked about authentic leadership. How do you want to be as a leader? How are you going to develop strong leadership, gain the trust of your team and yet hold them to account, ensure that when they commit to do something, that they deliver on it. So it's, it's really important. So we're going to build on our story, which is us. So what are we like as individuals? And I remember I wanted, I had a view in my mind about the kind of leader I was. Um, you know, democratic, participative, uh, participative uh, affiliative. Um, you know, when I went on a development program, I found that that wasn't the kind of leader I was. I, I was a pace setter. I was more authoritarian. And in my behavior, uh, I wasn't the kind of leader I thought I was. Um, and I developed my style accordingly. I started to do more, develop more coaching behavior, more mentoring behavior. Um, and I started to listen more and tell less. So I developed my style um, and developed my leadership story. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, it's really important to do that. And it's practice. You know, I've got the uh, 10,000 hours practice. I've got, you know, 10,000 hours practice as a senior leader. Um, and you've done it with your clinical work, uh, your clinical development. And you can do exactly the same thing with your leadership. Um, it's just about practice. So being authentic, trust, developing trust, why should they follow you? You know, what is, what's the vision? What's the plan? What's in it for them? Um, and trust is really, really key. Um, people will trust you if you are open and honest with them. And I find being, showing a weakness or a vulnerability, telling a story about something that failed that you did. Um, clearly you don't want every story to be a failure, but by opening up and being honest with people, they will then open up with you and they'll trust you. And, but clearly the behavior has got to follow that. The minute a mistake is made, you can't jump on somebody like a ton of bricks because they're not going to put their hand up again. Uh, so, you know, if things go wrong. It's about what can we learn from that? How can we do it differently next time? Um, and that will engender trust. And, um, you know, what will you do for them? I, I, I think as leaders, you know, we can stand up with our teams and say, um, here's what I'm going to do for you um, and lay it out for them. And when I, when I handed over the UK reins to a colleague of mine, Patrick Allen, and he stepped up and I remember one of the first things he did was speak to the team and say, um, here's what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to back you up. I'm going to give you the resources, etc., etc., etc. Very powerful. Then he paused and he said, and here's what I expect from you in return you know, open, honesty, perform when you say you're going to do something. And actually, through that process, we hold ourselves and the team to a higher standard. And you know, if you're playing like, you know, you're playing tennis at the, on the Sunday at the tennis club and you get put up against someone who's a, who's a higher grade tennis player than you, what happens? You up your game, don't you? 
we perform better if we're playing someone who's better than us and we raise our standard and we raise the bar and that that really really important um, and what's in it for them you know uh, empathy will allow us to understand what what motivates the individuals what's different about each person and we could be thinking about what's in it for them as we said earlier people want to feel part of a team they want to understand what the vision is and they want to trust their leaders so we can as a leader we can do that and think about what's in it for them if we achieve our goal and we achieve their vision so developing our story and giving permission um i just want to spend a little bit longer on this this is this is uh, a fantastic i mean the potential we have is enormous and i often think you know we hold ourselves back don't we i mean should i go for that promotion or oh, i don't think i'm up to it um oh, i wouldn't be able to do that or i, I don't think oh or we might often say oh so and so wouldn't let me do that oh my partner won't wouldn't go for that or we create these excuses uh why we're not going to do something we hold ourselves back i think and as leaders we can help our team help our team members release that potential and, and allow them to step forward and have the confidence to try things knowing that if they fail we're not going to chuck them out and fire them or crucify them or embarrass them in front of the team if something goes wrong you know there's a process for dealing with that so um the team potential what's what's holding people back we can take the obstacles out of the way people may think there are obstacles and we can take them out of the way for people and provide them with the resources they need if they need resources usually it's about them just needing permission to go and do stuff um, it's as simple as that give permission um, and we've got to tease out those ideas um, you know when you were i've been at team meetings and, and the leaders are, are concerned that you know if they if they open the floor up to ideas they're going to take away 10 things to do um, now first of all you don't need 10 ideas you just need one idea the best idea and that's the one that's taken away and acted on till the next meeting um, but it's not the leader that needs to take that away it's the individual usually who volunteers the idea um, is motivated to implement it and you know you may want to cycle back with them and agree a milestone to review how they're doing maybe you come back next month and tell the team how it went okay great and oh shall we have a catch up on monday just let me know if you need anything because you want to keep tabs on it and make sure they don't go off at the wrong angle completely so you want to keep tabs on things but allow them to do the work and resist the urge to micromanage how they do it because they will do it differently to you and that's okay the point is to get the job done and get them motivated so when someone brings you an idea what don't you say well you don't say no no we tried that or that wouldn't work or i wouldn't do it like that what you say is great when can you do it unless it's you know your job is to make sure they don't destroy the business or hurt the customers assuming they're not doing that the answer is yes do it because you've got a motivated individual who's going to go out of their way to do this idea and they'll do it in addition to the day job it's not like they'll need extra time to do it because they're motivated they'll just get it done very very exciting um yes i've got onto this one already you know they're going to do it differently and it's really challenging really challenging for us um us micromanagers um and we all are because we did a the reason we got promoted often because we did a job really well so we got promoted and then we're then actually managing the people who do the job and it's so and they don't know what they're doing quite often so it's very tempting to tell them what to do and we mustn't do that we've got to let them develop to do it and particularly clinicians i mean who are real you are real detail people you do very very complex detailed processes consistently time and time again so to ask someone else to do something where you don't think they know what they're doing is really difficult but you have got to give them enough information but let them do it and let them make mistakes it's okay that's how they learn and then you what do we do? how do we do it differently next time ah okay so try that and you've got to delegate and you've got to take risk you've got to make sure you've got good people and you got and you got to understand the parameters in which they're operating and not let them hurt the patient or the or the business but you know having said that they need to they need to be allowed to go and fail um, and the faster you fail the faster you learn you heard that before the faster you fail the faster you learn people who get things right all the time don't learn very quickly that's another story so creating the brand um it's really important the brand your practice has 
So when the patient leaves the practice, when the patient puts the phone down, when the patient finishes an interaction with you and your team, how are they feeling? Are they smiling? Are they happy? Are they going to come back again? Are they going to refer family and friends, which as we know is the best way of growing, growing a practice? How are they feeling? And that's what your brand is, how people feel. Um, and I think as they walk out of that door, you can capture that and you can see from their faces how they're feeling. Uh, that's really, really important. So you'll build on your story and that'll become the practice's story, but you have to take the team with you and the team can build that with you. Um, and that smiling, you know, the smiling um, receptionist who made me that coffee, that to me summed up the brand of that practice. I mean, it had to be delivered by all the team members I interacted with, but having met one person, that's what happened and, and it really did. So it's what you do as a team. Um, how the team behave on a day-to-day -day basis, every day, whether they're un whether you're under stress or not. You know, what do you do when you're stressed out? Do you revert to type? You know, we all do that from time to time. So we've got to be conscious and pay attention to our behaviour and what we do. And the, so the brand will follow the culture of the business, and the culture is driven by the behaviour. Yeah. So the, how we all behave culturally sets the tone, and that's what the brand feels like. And then you can you know, refurbish the practice, you can change the logo, you can do all the marketing, that will all follow on. And, and very often I'll go into a practice that will want to rebrand first, they want to do the marketing first, <clears throat> and then it, there's a gap between the image they want to present and the behaviour of the people. So I always start here with the behaviour of the people, then we change the behaviour of the people and the experience, and then vet, the last thing we do is change the, the wallpaper and the colour scheme and the brand because if you put the brand out there and the experience isn't consistent, people are going to go, oh, that's just marketing bullshit. So change the experience and the brand can follow on from that. But it's, it's very powerful. Um, and I think branding is a much underutilized concept in, in, in healthcare and has got a lot of potential. I mean, I would say that my background is marketing, I suppose, but it's true. I believe it's true. So follow up. Um, this is a really important lesson. Uh, this is a nuts and bolts of leading, um, you know, doing what you say you're going to do. I'm a, my, one of the things that's amazed me most in my career is how many people don't do what they say they're going to do. And uh, I have been moderately successful in my career uh, in competition to some very smart people who, you know, just didn't do what they said they were going to do. And at the end of the day, people don't want to deal with them. They don't want to promote them. They don't want to trust them. And they're not going to get on. And uh, you know this is true with your patients and it's true with your team. And it's so easy for us not to do that. You know, the team meeting where, I was a member of the team meeting where the biggest issue, there were lots of suggestions from the team, but the biggest issue was the drains and the smell from the drains and the drains hadn't been fixed. And uh, the principal took that away as an action. And I went back the following four, I think two weeks later, I went back to practice and the loo stood, still smelt. And uh, the principal hadn't fixed the loo. I mean, that was such a simple thing to do, but it hadn't been done. And the teams, their whole confidence and trust in the leader was like, oh, all that, all that talk. So we sat there and I said, I'm not leaving this office until you ring the plumber. And we rang the plumber and we, we got that sorted. It was a simple thing to do. Um, but it, it went right to the heart of this. Do what you say you're going to do and do it when you say you will. If you're going to do something on Monday morning, do it. Don't go, oh, I'm too busy. Can we do it next Wednesday? Do it Monday. Now, it doesn't mean to say that on Friday, Monday's looking terrible. Of course, you can go to the person and agree. Can we can we move Monday because so and so's happened? And you can do that from time to time. But don't get to Monday and go, I haven't got time. All right, do what you say you're going to do, when you say you're going to do it. And if need be, set some milestones, you know, manage yourself and the team. If someone's taken off a big project to do and they're going to come back in a month with, with the completed project, it would be sensible for their sake and yours to set some weekly milestones. What are we going to achieve by week one? Um, and by the way, they set them, not you. So you say, let's set a, let's set a milestone. What can you do? Which bit can you do by next Monday? I'll get that bit done. Great. Okay, let's catch up on Monday and see how that went. And you manage that achievement so that if you get off track by the third week, we don't find out 
in a month at the meeting, we find out at week two or three and we can reset where we are. So set milestones. And what you're doing, of course, is you're managing behavior. You're managing what people do and you're helping them perform um, and keeping them on track. Um, and you can manage bad performers out of the business, as I said earlier, people who don't want to step up and perform. Um, you don't need to fire them. You just need to manage their behavior and they're going to go, oh, I can't stand this. I keep getting pulled over for not doing what I said I was going to do. I don't want to work here anymore. And they'll leave of their own accord in most cases. So you'll manage their behavior. But in most cases, it's helping the individual get to where they want to get to. They've had us, they've identified an issue, they've had an idea, you gave them permission, you're helping project manage them to that conclusion. So they can come back to the meeting in a month's time and say, we did this and they get a round of applause from the team and they feel great and they're gonna have another idea and do something else. So follow up, follow up, follow up. Reflect uh, and review. So as leaders, it's really important for us to make time for reflection. Because in the heat of the moment, we'll decide to do something or we'll get we'll learn a lesson from it, but actually it doesn't stick very often. You need to set aside with a clear head later and reflect. So each each day I do this, but each week I do this. What what interactions did I have? How did they go? You know, um, what could I have done better? What went well? What didn't go so well? What could I have done better? And you review that, okay, and you create these opportunities to improve. And I have, I was always having one-to-ones with my direct reports. In a small team, you can have one-to-ones with everybody. Maybe it's monthly, maybe it's quarterly, maybe it's weekly if there are challenges in the business. Um, and those interactions, you can practice listening, you can practice empathy. And then when you reflect afterwards, how did that go? Could I have done that better? Mm. Was I wrong to bring that topic up? Next time I'll try that, okay? And it's practice, practice, practice. So review is really, really important and you improve. You change and you improve and, and what works. So, you know, try that, improve and you make changes and you, you, you find out what works for you and your team members. Each of your team members is different. They have different challenges, ambitions, different desires. Find out what they are, empathize with them and make sure that you're helping them achieve what they want to achieve. Whether it's 5 p.m. on a Friday or 8.30 on a Monday morning, block out some time in your diary 30 minutes or 15 minutes or whatever it is to review how things went and make some notes. What are you going to do differently next time? Really, really important. So emailing uh, yourself with notes. I set reminders for myself to do things. Um, I've always done that. I used to be, it used to be a notepad. I'd write it down on a pad. And then when we got iPhones and Blackberries, I put, I put reminders for myself that popped up and, and reminded me. Um, so really, really important to reflect and review. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about some lessons from lockdown. Um, as the practices I work with have come back out, um, there are some things that work and some things that don't work. And um, you know where you focus is really, really important. Communication, communication, communication. I know everybody says this, and I can tell you, however much you communicate, if you ask the team, do you communicate enough? They'll always say no. You always have to communicate more. You cannot communicate too much. Tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them it, tell them what you've told them. And if you go back a week later, half of them won't remember you told them that. So communicate frequently, clearly and consistently. And it's to your team and of course to patients. I won't talk about the patient bit, that, that's something I'm sure you would have done, but you've got to communicate with your team. Where are we going? What's changing? What's their input? How can they help? And as you make changes in the practice, of course, you have discovered that it may involve changes to terms and conditions and, and how the practice works. And you want people on board with that. So they, the team needs to be involved in making those changing, suggesting the working hours and how we can get around things. So, so you want flexibility and cooperation. And these are really uncertain times. People are worried and concerned. So we want to make sure that they're on board. Um, so communication, marketing, you know, don't go to new customers, leverage existing patients. Of course, there's a place for marketing to new customers, but it's the most expensive customer acquisition route. Um, existing patients, there's enormous potential in your patient base, leverage that. They like you, they get, they're buying dentistry, they're buying it from you, they'll buy more from you. People most likely to buy from you are your most recent customers. 
um, and the last thing you do is go to new customers. And there's a place for that, but that's the last thing you do. Leverage your team for productivity. You know, we need to increase productivity to compensate for spending longer with fewer patients. You know, we can digitize the patient journey, of course, um, but we can delegate more to the team. We can make sure the team, by being engaged, have more ideas and are more enthusiastic and work harder. And that productivity improvement can go a long way to offsetting the downside, the downturn in productivity as you're seeing fewer patients for longer. Some practices are, are opening for longer hours. They're opening up that third room that didn't used to get used to compensate. But actually, just engaging your team more, getting more ideas from them will improve productivity dramatically. Um, and that engagement, you know, it creates a happier team, a more productive team, um, and you can spend more time with your team. Um, it's, it seems counterintuitive, but at a time, you know, when uh, so much is going on and there are so many challenges, the more time you spend with your team, the better. And I've, you know, I've heard customers say to me, or oh, dentists say to me, you know, um, actually, this is great because I'm getting longer with my patients. I can spend more time with them explaining treatments. I'm enjoying it more. Um, and I can also spend more time with my nurse, you know, so there are benefits and uh, really take advantage of those. So some very, very quick uh, lockdown lessons. So leadership challenge for you uh, to think about um, tomorrow or the next day. You know, I would ask myself a couple of questions. What are the major issues and challenges that you're facing now? Uh, either as a clinician in your in your practice with your team or with, with your practice your whole practice team if you're a principal what are the challenges you're facing what leadership capabilities will be needed to handle these situations skillfully you know I, do you need to spend more time with your team members do you need to understand their skill sets and their ambitions um, do you need to bolster your skill sets in these areas you know and how are you going to do that so what development needs do you have so create your own personal development plan, basically, for your leadership, your own personal leadership development plan. What steps, what training you're going to have, what seminars, webinars you're going to watch. You know, is there another dentist you can use whose experience that you respect? That you can ask to be your mentor. You can have confidential one to ones with once a week to, to bounce ideas and experiences off. Really, really powerful. So create your own personal development plan. Um, so next steps to, to start to wrap up. Um, it all starts with the team. You know, this is one of the this is one team that I remember. Forty plus people who uh, that they decided they had an idea to do a charity um, healthcare charity exercise. Um, it was at the weekend, so they spent all Saturday and some Saturday night and Sunday on this program, and they input amazing amount of effort on their own. And they just said to me, well, can we have Henry Shine t-shirts to wear? And I said, yeah, what else do you need? And they, and they said, no, no, we're going to raise the money and we're going to go on this. And they were the, they were the stewards for the pink, um, uh, the pink walk, the moonwalk that was through London. It used to happen uh, overnight when women would walk in aid of um, cancer charities uh, to raise awareness and money for that. And this team just did that off their own back. It was absolutely fantastic. And they were motivated and excited. And when they came back into the office on Monday morning, they were such a buzz on. Uh, and there was nothing they couldn't do. Really, really exciting. So, um, so in terms of your team, you know, find out their needs. Um, what is it they come to work for? What inspires them? What gets them going? You know, get their ideas about improving the workplace. As we were, Chris and I were talking earlier about some practices looking a bit sad and dowdy because we we come in every day and we don't realise what what someone with a fresh pair of eyes would see. Well, our team members see it, uh, and they know. And quite often, I know I've asked people how we could improve something, and they've said something so obvious. You're like, well, why didn't you say that before? Well, no one asked me. Okay, well, they know what they know what the ideas are and they, and they can provide them and provide structure for your team. You know, the, the need we need to have meetings, you need to have agendas. People need the security of knowing what topics are going to be discussed. What do I need to prepare, prepare for and how can we be productive as a team? We don't want people going around saying, oh, another meeting, a waste of time. Let's have some structure and active input. Go around the table and get everybody's input, celebrate success catch people doing something right you know we catch people doing stuff wrong catch them doing stuff right um, and thank people and ce celebrate when they do things well 
you know, to, to sum up now, people want to come to work, they want to understand their jobs and know how their work contributes to the success of the practice. They want to know how what they do contributes to the success of the practice. So that's that's really important and it's easy to do. And critically for us as leaders making mistakes and getting it wrong, people want to be led. People are crying out for leaders. And you, you can see that in the world around us, but it's true in our organisations. People will give you the benefit of the doubt. If you're open and trusting and listen to them, people will give you a lot of leeway. They really, really want to be led. So I hope we've covered uh, all these topics here. If there's anything missing, um, you've got the opportunity to uh, ask questions. My suggestion tomorrow, um, you know, as you get back into practice, um, calculate your ideal pie, take steps to action it. You know, what should you be doing to improve that? Put together a personal development plan for your leadership. What are those key challenges and what skill sets do you need? Which lessons will you use? What are you going to use in your day-to-day -day life? Um, set a regular time to reflect on your leadership style. Just Even if it's just 15 minutes a week, it really, really will help you. Um, and create an updated to-do list of next steps. Set yourselves milestones. Really, really important. And uh, how can I help? I, I can coach, mentor, help you with team development. Just contact me and uh, I'll be more than happy to help, either, either virtually or in person. Chris, hand back to you. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much, Simon. That was uh, very good. So uh, let me see. I don't know if you can stop screen sharing. I don't quite know how that works, mind you. Um, yeah. But anyway, there we go. All right. Um, I found that fascinating. Thank you very much, Simon. I uh, wrote loads of notes, actually. So uh, I think even though I've heard it twice and, uh, you know, I've been through lots of management stuff myself, it's always brilliant to, to get a fresh pair of eyes and a, some some fresh words. I've got nine lessons, which was good. good. Um, I was going to ask you about quick hits, but I think you answered that right at the end. Uh, everyone loves a quick hit, don't they? Which which is good. And uh, one thing I was going to ask you is, in your time, what what would you say has been one of your most challenging management decisions issues that you've come across? Wow. Um, there's so many. <laughs> <laughs> um, I had, well, I tell you, when I had, um, I had a real difficulty. My IT team and my marketing team had, uh, in one of my organizations, were at loggerheads. And um, I decided to flush it out. It was an elephant in the room at a, at a meet, management meeting. And I decided to flush it out. And it was a really high risk strategy, I thought because they were, and we got this debate going and they were really arguing with each other and slagging each other off and it got worse and worse. So I called time out and let's get a coffee. And, um, and I spoke to each of them in turn and then we got back together and the heat had come down and we found a way forward. And um, it, 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 at the time I felt like the wheels were about to come off had I done the right thing. And I'd called out the elephant in the room. There was a lot of trust around the table but the, the level of disagreement had got to the point where they were really, there was some real heat there. Um, wow. And I think I, I did the right thing um, because I couldn't let that continue. And I wanted the whole team to be part of it and see that we were mm. fronting an elephant that was there. But that was really challenging experience. It gave me a headache. Anyway. Yeah. And, and I suppose also it takes a, a, a bit of guts, doesn't it, to say, actually, guys, we just need to, to, to take time out and chill out a bit so as you can bring it down as the danger is uh, you know from as I know from my experiences you don't actually get involved and and it then it sort of takes on a whole new turn <laughs> which then makes it sometimes very tricky to pull back from where you were originally yeah and, and so two points one is that elephant is there whether you call it out or not and yeah. if you don't everyone's going well why isn't he mentioning it and secondly if things get too heated or you can use this technique anywhere. Like if you're doing a presentation and you lose your thread, let's have a coffee break. Yeah. And that gives you a chance to recollect your thoughts and the temperature to come down. And that's a very useful device. Assuming you haven't just come in from a coffee break. <laughs> that works. <laughs> and people don't, it's not a problem. No, brilliant, brilliant. I mean, for, for me, Simon, I found some really good tips in there. I, 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 I did it. I did it last time when you, when we did the presentation. But I drew my own pie chart, and uh, 
uh, it's, it's quite interesting really it looks quite balanced to me I, I, was, I felt quite impressed with myself really did you, change, and, did you change anything or did you feel you were where you yeah knew? no they're, they're, they're very much the same sort of thing really I've, I've been probably a bit like you really and I it's we have so much to do don't we as business owners this is, this is all of us watching that the danger is if we're not careful we make ourselves really accessible and I don't mean to our team, I mean we make ourselves accessible by reading emails at 7 o'clock, 9 o'clock, 10 o'clock, 1 o'clock. I mean, we always find it quite amazing in Frank Taylor's that you'll get someone who sends an email through says, I'd like to view practice 7943 please and the time of the email is like half past 12 or two o'clock in the morning and you think, man, I hope you haven't either just woken up and or I hope you haven't not gone to bed. Uh, and, I, and I think it's a really good discipline to, to say, well, actually, I'm not going to look at my phone at a certain time and uh, I'm not going to answer a phone call. And, and I know that one of the things that, that Andy and I do when we go on holidays is we take the view that um, we will only answer the phone if it's a call from him and likewise from me because then we know it's really serious <laughs> and uh, what it means is actually then when you're on holiday you're actually on holiday you've got your downtime and, and, and we all need downtime especially after this year yeah that, that's undoubtedly D disciplines like i used to put my blackberry on the windowsill in the kitchen went in the sitting room and didn't look at it i looked at it maybe once in the evening and before i went to bed mm. and, uh, i remember saying to my team i will not answer emails out of working hours if it's urgent ring me if there's a fire ring me but yeah i did have a lot of problem with them, my american bosses oh really Interesting. but we came to an understanding yeah we realized dealing with europeans that we were not 24 7 and yeah. they did that didn't like Some, it but it's a fact someone we, taught me a great trick that, that i've used which is the fact of um if someone's got a query i can give you five minutes now or if you'd like to stay after work, we can have a chat about it then in more detail. Because it's amazing then how important or unimportant those things are when, mm. when people have to give up their own time. I found it quite a useful little tactic. Really. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I, anyone got any questions? I haven't had any come through, but if you have, then uh, this is your time to ask. Um, don't worry if you haven't. Um, Simon's details were at the slide end of his slide presentation, but um, I will read them out now just in case. Um, it's Simon at engagetheteam.co.uk and Simon's mobile is 07702 111070. So if you want to just have a, a conversation with with Simon uh, about a bit more detail because as you said Simon it's a massive whistle stop of of managing isn't it you know uh, right now I've learned in that an hour that you've taught I know now how to be a great manager and to engage my team <laughs> it, it doesn't quite it, it doesn't really do it justice the time that you get begs more questions um but I've got a toolkit I've developed for practice owners a, a 10 steps toolkit that I can take people through um, and I'll do a, I'll have a conversation at, you know, no charge with anybody for an hour and just see whether there's, uh, both of us think it's worth us working together on a more structured basis. So I'm happy to have a conversation with anybody, you know, about these topics, Chris, so no problem. That's brilliant. Uh, and, I, and I think for any of you that are seriously interested in, you know, you're, you're here, so you're seriously interested to, uh, learn more then uh, you know to, to have someone of Simon's experience and his knowledge and to, to be able to spend some time to see whether there's more to be done then then I would just say to you yeah guys um you know have a, have a conversation with him um I think I should probably tell you that we we don't earn any money from what Simon earns we're just doing it because we feel that Simon's message is something that all of you could do with listening so uh, just to reassure you there's no sort of commercial benefit for for, for us um, and we do it because we've known Simon for such a long time and we know the stuff that he does is good and has had positive effects on the people that he's worked with. Um, and for us, better practices, more profitable practices, uh, eventually when people come to sell them, they'll be worth more money. It'd be great. Um, so there we are. I don't haven't had any more questions come through, Simon. Okay. So 
I think um, we will probably call it at the end now. I'd just like to thank you for your time. Uh, all of you who've uh, listened um, and hopefully taken notes, I'd like to thank you all yet again for, for being here on a Thursday evening when a, where I am is very dark and a little bit miserable. Um, likewise, if you want to have a chat with me, then uh, you know where I am. I'm in uh, Frank Taylor's office. You can give us a call and uh, if I'm free, I'll have a chat. And if you want to send me an email, I think my email address is on our website, but if not, some will give it to you. Um, and that's it. Thank you very much. Um, have an enjoyable rest of the evening. Thank you once again, Simon. And thank you for all of you for listening in. Thank you very much.